Good afternoon. I'm Elizabeth Horner. I'm the head of the education department at the Carlos Museum, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's Antiquity program. I hope you've all had time to use the recipe and make your own sour cherry scones. Um, and I hope it won't be too long before we can welcome you back to the museum to have them in Ackerman Hall with us. Today, we are delighted to welcome um, Dr. Ruth Allen. She is the Carlos Museum's curator of Greek and Roman art. And during the COVID shutdown, she has been working on an exhibition of the Carlos collections of ancient gemstones that will come to the museum uh, year after next, I think, right, Ruth? Um, and it will be a beautiful exhibition. And But in addition to that, she's been participating in Emory's Arts and Social Justice Initiative, which is sponsored by the Ethics Center and the Center for Creativity in the Arts. And as part of this innovative project, she is co-teaching a university course with Cindy Patterson from Ancient Mediterranean Studies and the Atlanta playwright Calvin Ramsey. So some of the pieces that she'll be looking at with you today are, uh, her students are looking at that class as well. It's called Facing the Slave um, in Antiquity and in the Museum. She's also just recorded a short video about works in the Carlos collections that relate to the uh, ancient roots of American democracy and the importance of every citizen using their vote to make their voice heard. So I will put that a link to that talk uh, in our chat today and it will also be on the Carlos Museum website. I hope that all of you will use the Q&A function today to ask your questions of Ruth. I will feed them to her live and she can answer them live. And so Ruth, welcome and thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, just to echo Elizabeth, um, it's, it's great to have so many of you joining us via, via Zoom. Um, I hope some of you have made those scones. I don't have any, so if you want to, you know, <laughs> drop them around, that would be fantastic. Um, so as Elizabeth mentioned, um, I am Ruth Allen, the curator of Greek and Roman art here at the Carlos. Um, and this afternoon, I am going to be discussing um, some of the themes that kind of have um, I've been exploring with my students um, in, in, the, in the course that I've been teaching this semester, um, specifically thinking about um, the, the ways in which um, Africa as, as a place and as an idea um, kind of is, is, is presented in, in the Greek and Roman imagination, um, as well as the ways in which people of African origin are depicted in Greek and Roman art. Um, this is not going to be a comprehensive survey or overview um, of what is, of course, a vast and nuanced subject that, um, you know, that ranges across genre from caricature to portraiture, um, across media from marble sculpture to uh, engraved gemstones, such as the one that you see on the screen at the moment. Um, and in content from the representation of um, enslaved captives um, to the depiction of emperors. Um, and I'm just showing you here two objects which um, are not in the Carlos collection, um, but two really kind of extraordinary portraits that, um, that survived to us from the Roman world. Um, on the left, um, a marble portrait head of, um, of an Ethiopian, uh, youth called Memnon, um, who was a pupil of, um, of the Athenian uh, millionaire politician and um, patron of the arts, Herodes Atticus. Um, and this head is in the, um, the Altus Museum in Berlin. Um, and then on the right, um, this really amazing painted family portrait of the Emperor Septimius Severus, who came from the town of Lepkis Magna um, in what we now call Libya. Um, so instead of giving you a sort of an overview, um, I'm going to be focusing on four objects from the collection here at the Carlos that take us from Greece to Rome um, and from the 5th century BCE to um, the turn of the 4th century CE. Um, and the aim first and foremost really is to 
bring these objects to um, wider attention. They're, they're small objects that are often um, perhaps easily overlooked in the gallery space. Um, and so my hope is to kind of bring some historical context to these objects so that when you're next able to visit us, um, you will um, be able to kind of uh, think about them and, and understand them in a different way. Um, but what I'm in fact more concerned about, and, and I hope that we'll be able to discuss in the Q&A session at the end, um, is not so much the significance of these objects in their ancient context, as their significance in today's context, in this time and place, at the Carlos Museum, at Emory University, in Atlanta, Georgia, in 2020. Because as more qualified scholars in this area of research than I have noted, um, this is of course a subject that uh, not only asks us to recognize the diversity of the ancient Mediterranean world and to examine the ways in which that difference was evaluated, thought about and presented in antiquity, both positively and negatively, um, but also to question whether and how to apply contemporary thinking about race and racial prejudice to the classical past. And perhaps most crucially, to confront the ways in which many people's perception of the classical world today continues to foreground and at times to lionize um, an imagined and misunderstood whiteness um, that has been used to bolster um, theories of white supremacy. So there is a lot to unpack, um, but I'm going to start with a geography lesson um, and also with an object that um, I think reveals some of the challenges of iconography um, and also of language uh, that getting to grips with Greek and Roman depictions of people um, of African origin can entail. So the first thing to keep in mind um, is the early Greek understanding of the landmass that we now call the continent of Africa was vague and shrouded in myth. Uh, and I'm showing you um, a map that's based on this kind of early uh, Greek understanding of geography. Um, the Greek term for, um, for the region as a whole, which is Libya, really only refers to the northeastern uh, region of the continent. It seems that um, early Greek encounters with African people, namely with Egyptians um, and Nubians, was filtered through Egypt via trade and warfare. Uh, so in the late 7th and early 6th centuries BCE, for example, Greek mercenaries from Ionia and Caria um, on the uh, on the southwest um, coast of Anatolia of modern day Turkey, fought under the Egyptian pharaohs Samtik I and II in a campaign against the Kushite kingdom of Nubia, a region in what is today um, northern Sudan and southern Egypt. The Greek historian Herodotus, writing in the 5th century BCE, describes an invasion of Egypt from the south by the Kushite king Sabakos and a great army of warriors. The Greek word that Herodotus uses for these people is aithiops, um, a compound word uh, which is formed from the Greek aitho, which means I blaze or I burn, and the Greek ops, um, the word for face, um, which tends to be described as um, people with, with burnt or blazing faces, but really describes the appearance of a people whose skin the Greeks thought was darker um, than theirs because the land they lived in was hotter. And this follows the same kind of uh, logic um, by which the Greeks believed that the people that lived um, in the Northern regions of Europe were, were pale skinned because their skin was burnt pale by cold winds. So this word, Ethiops, is of course the word from which our Ethiopian derives, um, but it appears to have been used in antiquity both to describe people um, from what we would consider Sudan, um, as well as more broadly as a term for 
people with skin that was darker than the Greeks' own and who lived on the southern edges of the Greeks' known world. And it's perhaps interesting to pause here um, and just to consider how for the Greeks and later for the Romans, um, perception of, of colour could be as much about luminescence as about saturation and hue. So for something to be both blazing um, and, and darkened, as implied by the nuance of that word, Ithiops, um, was not necessarily a contradiction. And I'm showing you here um, a tiny ringstone in the um, in the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore, um, which is carved from from black jasper and which depicts the head of an Ethiopian in in profile that's been carved into that surface um, of the stone. And I really think that the the engraver of this stone has made very clever use of of the material, um, which is not just dark in colour, but which is also reflective um, to, to really kind of convey both the, the colour and the shine that is evoked by that word, Ithiops. Um, and it's perhaps also worth noting here that um, the poet Homer describes Ethiopians as being favoured by the gods. He tells us that the gods would, um, would go to visit the Ethiopians to share meals with them. Um, and that in much of Greek, much Greek literature, one of the ways that you can recognize that someone is divinely favored is by um, the sort of quality of shine um, that they have about their person. So by the time that we get to um, the Roman period, understanding of the geography and also of the inhabitants of Africa has altered, um, but is still very much confined to um, the northern regions of, of the continent as we understand it. The term Africa applies specifically to the Roman province of Africa Proconsularis, which you can see um, here. I hope you can see my cursor. Um, uh, which was established in 146 BCE following Roman defeat of the Carthaginian Empire um, and accords approximately to modern day Tunisia, um, to um, the northeast of Algeria and to the southwest of Libya. Um, and the word likely comes from um, the name of, a, of an indigenous tribe, the Afri, um, that lived in this region. Um, and just to kind of help orient you, so to the east of, um, of Africa Proconsularis, we have Cyrenaica um, and Egypt, which become part of the Roman Empire in, in the first century BCE. And then to the south and the west, we have the kingdoms of Numidia and Mauritania, which also become um, provinces of the Roman Empire. Um, so this really, um, swift geography lesson is, is just to sort of emphasize that um, Africa and African um, are, are largely unhelpful and anachronistic terms, um, that in most circumstances we might be better um, to replace with Ethiopian, for example, or Numidian, um, depending on context, except of course what we now call the country of Ethiopia um, does not accord exactly with the ancient Greeks understanding um, of Ethiopia as a place or their use of Ethiopian as a, as a descriptor for, um, uh, for, for people. Um, but what I think is kind of um, at risk by the, the imprecise use of these terms, um, or perhaps the generalized use of these terms, um, I think is well uh, demonstrated by this object, um, which is in the Carlos collection. Um, so this is a Cornelian uh, ringstone. Um, in reality, not even three eighths um, of an inch in height. Um, and it's uh, Cornelian, um, this kind of wonderful orangey red color. Um, and it's, it's incised um, with the profile head of a woman wearing um, an elephant skin headdress. And perhaps you can make out the ear um, hanging down the back of her neck um, and the tusks above her forehead um, and the trunk which curves back over, um, over the crown of her head. 
this motif is um, is not uncommon. It appears on other gems as well as on um, numerous coins. And it, it tends to be referred to by scholars um, either as a personification of Africa, um, as a personification of Libya, um, or a personification of Alexandria, um, the, um, a city in Egypt that was the capital of um, the Ptolemaic dynasty there. Um, and when this particular gemstone was acquired by the Carlos, it was catalogued as a personification of Africa. Um, but is that who it is? And is that the right word to use to describe this figure? Um, so there are coins that, that exist, um, that were minted um, in the second half of the first century BCE, um, that show a profile head wearing an elephant skin headdress. Um, and these were issued by um, Pompey the Great, who some of you may have heard of, um, the Roman general, uh, enemy of, um, of Julius Caesar, um, and also by his supporters, um, including in fact, um, kings of uh, Numidia and Mauritania. Um, and it's been suggested that this head depicts um, a personification of, of Africa as a geographic location. Um, so if it does uh, represent Africa or more strictly that province, the Roman province of, of Africa, um, then really it's, it's as much an emblem of Pompey's power in that region and the allegiance of um, neighboring kingdoms to his party um, as it is a, a representation or a personification of a specific place. Um, and over time, this, this particular motif that we see on, on these three coins is repeated. Um, it's repeated on coins issued by various emperors. Um, and over time, it, 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 it does come to stand for Rome's imperial authority. Um, and we do find examples that um, also have inscriptions that, that specifically identify this head, um, helpfully, as Africa, sometimes as Mauritania, um, and sometimes also as Alexandria. So does that help us with our gem? And is our gem indeed even depicting the same thing? I'm not sure. Um, Pompey and, and the subsequent coins are actually drawing on a much earlier visual tradition um, of royal portraiture um, that begins with this coin on the top left of your screen, um, which was issued under um, Ptolemy the First. Ptolemy, um, who who became um, king of Egypt following the um, the death of Alexander the Great um, and the division of Alexander's empire amongst um, his various generals. Um, and this coin actually depicts Alexander, um, and we can see he again is wearing this elephant skin headdress. Um, and this is an image that scholars agree is celebrating Alexander as um, conqueror of India, and that by issuing this on his coinage, this is also about Ptolemy kind of claiming um, legitimacy and authority via association with Alexander. Um, and this motif is very quickly adopted by other kings um, of other um, um, uh, kingdoms within the Hellenistic world, um, within what had been Alexander's empire. Um, and, it, and it becomes a kind of general symbol of kingship. Um, it's especially common um, on coins and on gems and on other objects that depict members of um, the Ptolemaic dynasty, so the, the, the ruling family that, um, that reign in, in Egypt um, down to uh, the final decades of the first century BCE um, with, with the rise of the Roman Empire. And I'm showing you at the bottom left here um, an impression that perhaps has been taken from a gemstone. Um, uh, so if you can imagine these stones that are carved with an image that's incised into the surface that are then pressed into a lump of clay, leaving an image in relief. Um, and we can see um, 
a portrait head here of a Ptolemaic king, again, wearing that elephant headdress. Um, and then the object on the right of your screen is this really extraordinary silver dish that was discovered in, um, in the villa at Boscoriale in Italy, which was destroyed like Pompeii um, following the eruption of Vesuvius. And this depicts um, Cleopatra Cellini, who was a Ptolemaic princess, um, uh, daughter of Mark Antony and Cleopatra, and wife of King Juba II of Mauritania and Numidia. Um, and I think that the Carlos gem, specifically in terms of the position of the trunk, um, is, is closer to some of these images than it is to the Roman coins. Um, and that distinctive hairstyle um, that we see with these ringlets um, is also characteristic of um, depictions of Ptolemaic queens. So is this a personification of Africa and therefore an expression of Roman conquest and empire? Or is it a depiction of a Ptolemaic, perhaps a Numidian queen? Given Rome's absorption of these kingdoms, um, of course, it could be both. Um, and I don't have an answer yet. Um, but either way, it reminds us that we cannot assume uh, an easy or generic category um, of Africa or African um, when we're talking about um, depictions from the Greek and Roman worlds. So moving on, but also backwards in time, um, to this object, which is the, the earliest piece from the collection that we're going to be discussing today, um, and, and really kind of allows us to get into this issue of um, the representation of ethnicities. Um, this is a type of vessel known as a lekythos, um, which was used for storing oil. Um, this piece was made in Athens in around 430 BCE. Um, and this type of vessel, when we find it decorated with this very distinctive white background, um, using a technique known as, as white ground, um, was specifically used in, in funerary contexts. So they were used in, uh, in rituals um, where offerings of oil would be made at the, um, at the graveside. And because of this, we often find um, these vessels decorated with relevant funerary imagery. And so that's the case with, with the Carlos example. And I'm showing you um, a kind of split screen um, with images of of both sides of the vase. Um, so what we have is the depiction of two women um, approaching a grave monument at the center of the scene. Um, and this is actually um, the, the grave of a little baby boy who we see depicted seated on top of the stone at the center. Um, and just a note about why the figure on the on the right of your screen looks like um, they're, they're a floating um, head and pair of arms. Um, the, the technique by which these vases were decorated um, involved the application of paint after firing. Um, and this means that paint was incredibly delicate and it often doesn't survive very well. Um, so that's what's happened here. Um, the woman on the left is um is the mother um and she's shown veiled and um tightly wrapped in in mourning dress and she has um the idealized facial features um that mark her out according to the conventions of athenian art in the classical period as an athenian citizen and it's important to note here um, that although we tend to think of Greek art as being naturalistic, um, we can't think about Athenian art um, as, as really providing any kind of documentary evidence for how people looked. Um, these are uh, generic images that give us access to a kind of ideology um, that is expressed um, through the representation of um, uh, standardized um, physical characteristics. Um, and this is demonstrated when we look at the figure on the right, um, who differs from the woman on the left in, in a number of ways. Um, firstly, 
her distinctive cropped hairstyle, which we can see is quite different from the way that this woman's hair has been pulled back. Um, this is a common indicator in Athenian art of, um, of enslaved status, um, as is the fact that she is shown laboring. She's carrying a heavy basket um, that even though we only have um, the sort of the shoulders and the head surviving, we can see that she's stooping forward under the weight of, um, and this basket would have contained offerings um, or the tomb so she's carrying this 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 heavy object while the um or the woman on the other side looks on so she's characterized as um as enslaved in this depiction also according to the conventions of athenian art um this woman's facial features with a slightly um turned up nose suggest that she is ethiopian and we can compare her to other depictions on um, classical Athenian vases that show myths that, that, um, that take place in um, the land of Ethiopia. So this is a depiction of the Ethiopian princess Andromeda, um, who, as we all know, um, is, is chained to a rock, is a sacrifice to a sea serpent, only to be um, rescued by Perseus. And then here, um, a depiction of the Ethiopian king Memnon, who, according to Homer, um, fights with the Trojans um, during the Trojan War. Now, being Ethiopian in Athens was not synonymous with being enslaved, nor were depictions of enslaved people always also depictions of Ethiopians. Uh, most enslaved people in Athens seem to have been from Thrace, um, a region uh, around the Black Sea um, and Asia Minor, modern Turkey. Um, and we know this from surviving uh, uh, inscriptions from tombstones, um, as well as from the, the literary record. There also doesn't appear to have been prejudice based on skin color. In fact, Herodotus tells us that um, the Ethiopians were the tallest and the most beautiful of people. And Memnon um, is, is described as being nearly an equal to Achilles, who is the, the ultimate Greek um, hero. But I think we can see in some of these images the establishment of a visual and therefore also of a cultural hierarchy that is predicated on physical difference, which means that Memnon, as he is shown here, does not look like his fellow Ethiopian warriors. He looks like Achilles. Um, and I'm showing you the other side of the vase, which shows Achilles fighting the Amazon queen Penthesilea. And I think we can see how these two heroes are visually um, uh, we're, we're being cued in to think of them as equal and to think of Memnon um, as looking like Achilles. And on the vase in the Carlos, um, this physical difference, I think, is working um, to define what a free Athenian woman looks like on one side, in opposition to what a non-free, um, non-Athenian woman looks like on the other. But because I'm always looking for evidence of subversion, I like to think that the painter of this vase has deliberately shown the baby boy not looking at his mother, but looking at the enslaved woman that's approaching him. Um, we know that for Athens' wealthiest citizens, childcare was typically provided by wet nurses who were enslaved. Um, and again, from the evidence, seem for the most part to have been uh, Thracian. Um, and I wonder if this, you know, this small gesture on this vase, um, I've been thinking a lot about it and, and I think it really is kind of reminding us and underscoring the fact that the, the bonds, but also the burdens of care that existed between um, free and enslaved in Athens um, and the potential for those bonds to complicate the hierarchy um, that these images are sort of trying to um, establish. Moving forward 
in time to um, quite a different object. Um, I think we also see something quite different at play. Um, this is a, um, uh, a ceramic drinking cup um, in the shape that's known as a calyx cup. Um, and it was this particular shape was developed in, in Greece in the late fourth century BCE. And it was originally imitating um, vessels of a similar shape made from precious metal that were popular in the kingdom of Macedonia, which is to the north of, of Greece. Um, and these Macedonian cups were actually also imitating um, precious metal vessels that were used in, in Persia. Um, there are many examples um, that are black glazed um, that, that survive, some of which have been excavated in, in Athens. Um, but cups that are gilded, like this version here, which is in the Carlos, um, and which dates to the first decades of the third century BCE, are rare. And we can imagine that they were um, intended or perhaps were repurposed as grave goods because the gilding is incredibly delicate um, and, and not practical for any kind of um, functional use. The Carlos cup is um, decorated at its center with um, a relief molding, um, a relief head of Ethiopian. Um, and you perhaps have to trust me that that's what this is. I apologize for the, um, the poor quality photograph. Um, but it's perhaps better understood when we look, um, we look at it alongside this object, which is a, um, a marble, a life-size marble head um, now in the Brooklyn Museum. And we can see um, that these, uh, the marble head and the, um, the molded head share similar features, specifically um, these tightly curled um, hair. And there are other examples of these calyx cups with um, Ethiopian heads decorating the interior, um, which prompts us to ask the question, what made such a motif appropriate or desirable as decoration for a drinking cup? Um, there are other examples that are decorated with theatre masks at the centre of the cup. And I think this reminds us that um, Dionysus, as god of wine, was also god of theatre, um, and in both capacities was, was a god of altered states um, who offered freedom uh, to the drinker. And so I think in this context, the Ethiopian and the theatre mask um, are really acting as, as equivalent symbols of Dionysian otherness and also of, of liberation, quite literally offered um, to the drinker as he finishes his wine at the bottom of his cup. And if we think about these vessels passing from the drinking party into the tomb, then they become symbols of a different kind of transformation, um, perhaps signaling the, the Dionysian pleasures of the afterlife. And this leads us to, um, to my final object on this whistle stop tour. Um, another vessel, this time a wine jug made in around 300 CE in Tunisia, in what was the Roman province of um, Africa Proconsularis. And this wine jug takes the shape of the head of a satyr. Um, Satyrs were uh, mythological creatures that were half man, um, half goat, and they're often shown with these sort of slightly wild animalistic features. So they have pointed ears, which we can just make out on this image, furrowed brows, bushy eyebrows, um, and grinning mouths. Um, and satyrs were um, followers of, of Dionysus, so um, entirely appropriate to find a wine jug um, in the form of a satyr. A Latin inscription on the, um, on the neck of this jug reads ex, offi, um, ex officia navigi. Um, and this tells us that this jug was made in the workshop of Navigius. Um, Navigius workshop 
uh, is well attested. We have uh, many other vessels like this that are signed in similar ways. And his workshop seems to have been at the center, um, if not actually at the helm of a network of um, ceramic workshops located in central Tunisia at the turn of the fourth century CE. Um, and so as well as having other vessels that are signed um, uh, as being from Navigius's workshop, we have other vessels that are signed um, by other potters. Um, but what's, what's significant is that we find vessels uh, that are signed as coming from other workshops that are made using the same molds. So this suggests that there were um, uh, connections between these workshops. And Navigius is the most prolific, which has led, has led some scholars to um, suggest that he was um, at the center of this um, ceramic producing empire. Um, Almost all of these head vessels have been um, found in Tunisia, in modern Tunisia, and this suggests um, that they were serving a primarily local market. Now, there was a long tradition within Greek and Roman art of vessels made in the form of human heads, um, including of satyrs and sometimes also of Ethiopians, and this is an example um, in the Getty Museum in Los Angeles. Um, and these vessels were used in um, a particular context um, in the symposium, which was a, an all male aristocratic drinking party um, that, that really was a kind of fundamental cultural practice um, in the Greek world and that continues um, under the Roman Empire in the form of the banquet. So we might assume that these um, head vases that are being made in Tunisia um, were also primarily for serving wine, um, in which context, as I mentioned, the satyr was an entirely appropriate subject. Um, and that these objects therefore demonstrate um, uh, the kind of process of Romanization, um, whereby local elites are sort of adopting uh, banqueting as a kind of mainstream Roman cultural practice. But I'm not sure it's so easy as that. Um, in terms of style, these head vases are distinctively North African. Um, What's significant is that of those that have been found in North Africa, um, they were all found in graves. And I think this encourages us to look for slightly different interpretations. Um, indeed, although we don't know the identity of Navigius or of the potters um, that worked for him, we must surely assume that some, if not all of them, were local. And we can presumably also say the same for his clientele. Um, so this vase, I think, actually gives us access to um, a local agency and to a local way of looking. Um, and so although it may be that the popularity of these head vases has to do with um, the willing uptake of, of Roman culture, um, they may have stood for something else. Um, and one possibility, one way that we may look at them um, has to do with religion. Um, Dionysus's alter ego, um, who was known as Liber Pater, um, which translates as the free father, um, was widely worshipped in, in uh, the Roman provinces of North Africa. Um, and he was worshipped as a version of a local deity called Shadrapha. He was a healing god and patron of the city of, of Lepkis Magna. Um, and we know that Septimius Severus, who we saw um, at the start of this talk, um, who was from Lepkis Magna, when he became emperor, he, he inaugurated his, um, his reign um, in Rome with an athletic competition that was, that was held in honour of Liber Shadrapha. Um, so to northern, to North African eyes, um, these vessels buried in tombs as, as markers perhaps of hope for a happy afterlife 
may have had nothing to do with Rome at all. They may have spoken to a local identity. So why pay attention to these objects? Um, in reality, it is not new um, and it's not controversial to, um, to acknowledge that the ancient Mediterranean world was diverse. Um, and I think these objects really do kind of bring home that the Mediterranean was a kind of complex ecosystem of diverse peoples and diverse cultural practices um, who sometimes made use of the same visual language and sometimes adopted and adapted um, that visual language for specific contexts and needs. I think these objects also remind us that ethnic difference could be the basis for prejudice in antiquity. Um, and that needs to be acknowledged and presented um, in, in a museum context. Um, because I think despite our knowledge of the diversity of the ancient world, many museum presentations do perhaps give um, uh, a false impression of what um, ancient Greece and Rome looked like. I think these objects do show us that difference could be embraced and celebrated and memorialized. Um, and they remind me um, not to assume a singular imperialist Roman viewpoint for the interpretation of the objects in my care. So I'm gonna leave it there and um, look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ruth. We do have a couple of questions and if you have more, please add them to the Q&A function and I'll share them with Ruth. Um, going back to the beginning of your talk, uh, one of our attendees is thrilled by the idea of an actual elephant skin mask <laughs> and wants to know, was it actually based on an actual elephant skin mask or is this um, more a, a costume of some kind? Um, such a great question. I, <laughs> I wish I could say that, yes, absolutely, um, uh, you know, the Ptolemaic kings and queens were wearing elephant cloaks. Um, the iconography is, um, I'm going to show you the head of Alexander. Um, the iconography is kind of riffing on, on pre-existing iconography, um, specifically on depictions of the Greek hero um, Heracles, who is quite commonly shown wearing a lion skin head. Um, and that's the sort of common motif that we find in, in, in Greek art from very early times. Um, Alexander uh, sort of claimed to be related to Heracles. So um, it was sort of a, a game of kind of reference, sort of showing him dressed in this way, um, sort of getting you to think about that, that mythical um, relationship to Heracles. Um, so that's that's really what this is kind of playing on, as well as the sort of fact that um, Alexander was, you know, uh, really sort of celebrated as as conqueror of, of India and the East. Um, so I don't I don't think they were wearing elephant skin headdresses in real life, but maybe someone else knows differently. Who knows? Uh, we have another question, someone who must be familiar with the Carlos and our wonderful Parsons Conservation Lab and our conservation staff, because they ask if there have been imaging tests done on the Lekathos, and do, um, does it, do the test reveal any more of the original design? And then also, do we know if these um, vessels were created for specific people for specific situations, or are they more of a, a template? Um, two really good questions. I may be wrong. I don't think that we have used RTI or um, XRF on on that vase, and that's something that we definitely should do. Um, but I may be I may be wrong in that. Um, there's a lot of kind of debate about the sort of um, the the bespoke commissioning of of these vessels, and also about whether these vessels kind of are catering to um, uh, to an elite class or to a sort of slightly lower um, social class. Um, there's much discussion about how these vessels, painted vessels, relate to um, more costly metal 
vessels. Um, if we think about kind of workshop practice, I think it seems likely that there were specific workshops that specialized in certain techniques. And so we know that the, the Thanatos painter, who's, um, uh, which is the name given to the painter of the vase in the Carlos Museum, um, has produced other vessels of this type. So it seems likely that you, you, know, you would go to a specific workshop, a specific craftsman um, for, a particular need but whether they're being um designed and commissioned specifically i i'm not sure they tend to be quite formulaic in in their iconography so our conservator renee stein is with us today in the audience and she says that they have in fact attempted to image but very little was revealed yeah. uh, the pigments are likely organic and are not readily detected by elemental analysis so thank you renee thank you renee <laughs> Um, another question, do we know much about the painting of statues of Ethiopians? Right, um, we, it's a good question. I mean, we can see from this example um, in the Brooklyn Museum that, you know, artists were, could think about um, the sort of the color value of um, uh, the materials that they were using. So we do find, um, examples of marble sculpture where um, a particular type of marble has been selected um, that's appropriate to the depiction, which I think this um, demonstrates really nicely. Um, just whizzing back to our depiction of Memnon. Um, of course, um, we know that ancient sculpture was painted um, and you know, this can be revealed by various kind of imaging techniques. Um, and we know also that marble um, was could be could be varnished, could be given a kind of surface gloss that might sort of add tints to um, uh, to areas of flesh. Um, I don't know if the you know if the Berlin head has been looked at in that way. Um, I think it would certainly be interesting to know, but we can see just by comparing it to um, the, the Severan Tondo, this depiction of Septimius Severus, that, you know, um, sensitivity to skin tone um, could definitely be represented um, and could be shown, you know, quite comfortably as being as being different. Um, uh, you know, he, he, his skin tone is different to his wife and to his sons here. Another um, person asks if you can say anything about depictions in Greek and Roman literature and drama of particular ethnic groups. Right. Um, it's a good question. And it's one that, um, uh, yeah, is, is, is nuanced. So obviously we have kind of um, references to mythical figures like, like Memnon. Um, we also have kind of interesting uh, references to um, certain characters. So um, one of Odysseus's uh, um, crew members um, is described by Homer as having black skin. The word, the Greek word that's used um, specifies that sort of darkness of his skin. Um, there are also Roman, um, uh, love poems that sort of talk about the, the, the beauty and the desirability of um, women with dark skin. Um, so yes, skin colour and ethnicity is kind of treated in the literature. Um, it's often kind of referenced for quite specific purposes and sometimes it's not referenced. Um, so I think there's not one kind of binary as it were, there's not one kind of hard and, and fast rule. Um, we're thinking about um, uh, the ways in which uh, enslaved people are talked about in in classical literature. Um, sometimes they're characterized by their ethnicity. Um, more often they're sort of uh, they're presented in a way that kind of emphasizes their difference. And one of those differences might be ethnicity, but not always. Um, so I think there's, there's, um, there's nuance and there's selectivity about that, I think. 
So there's a very broad question, large question, I think. Um, <laughs> large question, bigger than our topic today, but I know that it's, it's something that you're thinking about a lot. And uh, if you could just share some of your thoughts. The question is, how do we correct the whiteness that perpetuates Greek and Roman art and the field of classics? No small topic. <laughs> a very big topic. Um, well, I think, you know, in, 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 I think there are many ways of approaching that that issue and and I and I also sort of want to say that actually that that issue is being um confronted and talked about by by many scholars and being done in a way you know it by many that are doing really kind of important work on this on this topic um I think I think one obvious approach is to do things like this is to you know is to sort of draw attention to to objects which often get kind of left out of um you know standard textbooks let's say on uh on greek and roman art that perhaps have more of a um uh academic or esoteric kind of um uh appeal or being worked on in quite niche areas um i think we you know in the museum world have to be mindful of of how we talk about these objects and of how we sort of nuance the um both you know both the sort of the visual and the material reality of of the ancient world um but also to acknowledge sort of the ways in which um the long history of collecting and of studying these objects has kind of led to um this misunderstanding um on the one hand that that you know, classical sculpture was white, and that is an accident of time um, that many of the pigments don't survive. It's an accident of um, uh, it's an accident of collecting and of cleaning, um, and it sort of becomes then an accident of how um, early scholars and early collectors of Greek and Roman art start to evaluate and talk about classical art. So it becomes the kind of the standard assumption. So that's one aspect of it. I think we also have to um, uh, think about the ways in which, um, you know, so the material is 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 not white. The people were not white. And I think actually um, this sort of misunderstanding that the Greeks and the Romans were white is is also problematic. You know, the Greeks don't. The Greeks don't describe themselves as as white. When they're thinking about color um, and and identity, they position themselves in the middle of um, the peoples that live to the north, whose skin is is white, and the people that live to the south, whose skin is much darker. They didn't consider themselves as as European and white, and that again is a sort of a misunderstanding that I think comes through um, the histories of collecting. And we have to accept the history of the ways in which classical art has kind of been written into um, European identity and political identity and um, national identity. Um, so it's complicated. I think, you know, one, one third route, I, I suppose, and one that um, is much harder to to bring about and perhaps it's much harder to um, think about in the confines of this talk. But I, you know, I think we have to think about the study of classics, you know, and it it is a discipline that is by and large, um, speaking from my own experience in the UK, it's taught in private schools. It tends to be, um, you know, predominated by um, white students. Um, and I think that's, that's something else that we have to kind of consider, you know, who, who is this subject for, I suppose. Thank you so much, Ruth, for your time today and your expertise. And um, this talk will be, it's been recorded and it will appear on our website soon. And I do encourage you to also visit our website and check out Ruth's um, explanation of objects in our collection that relate to citizenship and voting. And please everybody vote. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you.